Yeah. It's not that favorite word of mine either, then. What's that? Uh, <laughs> the one that was in my brain when I started talking and now it's not. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Idempotent? That one. <laughs> that one. <laughs> Well, it's that time. So it is August 23rd episode of Ask Some Praxis. Um, go ahead. <laughs> and today we are just the three of us, Mark, uh, Todd and I, and it's the Todd show today. Emily is on vacation this week and Derek is out in Seattle at the 365 Educon uh, conference. Next slide. And so today is the Todd show. So he is going to cover using Copilot and ChatGPT to write PowerShell. Um, our agenda for today is we're going to uh, cover what is AI. Uh, that is maybe a, not something you fully understand yet. So that'll be a good place to start. And then we'll uh, dial in and, and sort of level set on what the focus of our particular discussion is today, because obviously what is AI is a huge topic. Uh, and then how you should use it and what the tools are that Todd has found work pretty well for um, using these AI tools to help him write PowerShell. So with that, Go ahead, Todd. I, I the think floor I, is yours, I and I'm going to go will get just be silent, an ice cream. But... <laughs> and, um, well, yeah. I don't like ice cream. Oh, I love ice cream. No, no, you don't no. get a chocolate shake today. No, no chocolate oh, that's shake. Right. For that you. was the last couple. That's right. <laughs> All right. So, so what is AI? So, I, I wanted to talk about this. Start off with this, and, and obviously, so if you've got something to say, jump into the chat room. Um, my chat window is kind of covered right now, so somebody shout something out. We'll help if you've you got out. Questions. There we go. I love you guys. AI can never replace these guys. Um, so what is AI? So AI has become huge and it's become one of those terms that almost is meaningless because it's just so many things. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about some of that so that there's some context for what I talk about later on. So AI is a huge field. Uh, some examples of AI that, that are applicable to what I'm going to talk about today are things like NLP, which is natural language processing. We've seen that for a while. Any of us that have the she who shall not be named from Amazon, there's there's natural language processing there, or the she who shall not be named from Apple. But that's this idea that computers can now hear natural language. We don't have to you know, have specific syntax and keywords and all that. We can just speak in our normal voices. They can understand what we mean and they can reply back in that same sort of language. Um, another example of AI is machine learning. So this became really popular a few years ago. This is the idea that you can teach a computer how to do something, and then the computer can teach itself how to do it. So if any of you have watched uh, Silicon Valley on HBO, there was that season where they had that app, hot dog, not a hot dog. And they kind of go through the machine learning thing. They showed it a bunch of pictures of hot dogs, showed it where the hot dog was, and then they showed it a bunch of other pictures and had it figure out for itself where the hot dogs were at, and then it went through and gave it some feedback, some human feedback, and then basically just, you know, anytime somebody had a picture, they could see if there was a hot dog in it. That is an example of machine learning. Um, and the advantage that that has is once the machine is, you know, been trained correctly, it can learn a whole lot of things really, really fast. And that's what, what ChatGPT and those things have done. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. Computer vision, I, I brought that one up. That is an example of AI that is kind of not what we're doing, but this is what, we're, you know, the idea, like my phone has a thing now where I take a picture and then I can crop out things that I don't want in it anymore. So like if I've got a picture of vacation, you know, the sunset and the beach, I can go into this picture and have AI take my kids out of the picture so that I can really feel like I was relaxed on, on vacation. So that's another example of AI that's been around for a while. Um, so it's just this idea that, 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 AI can be a bunch of things, so when we're talking about it, try to be uh, specific what we're talking about. One thing I want to mention that is AI, machine learning, learns like humans do. All of the computer science behind machine learning and AI is based on what scientists and doctors know about the human mind. So it's designed to learn like we do for better or for worse. So it can implement biases, it can be tricked, all of these kind of things. I'm going to say this a bunch of times in this talk today, but it's best if you don't think about AI as being a computer or being software. It's best if you think of AI as being a form of intelligence because it, it really is. And I'll give you some examples about that later. Um, and then um, 
talking about the machine learning and all that, when I talk about ChatGPT, this is kind of the thing that, that got everybody excited about AI. That essentially read the internet in September of 2021, and then the way that the model was trained, it understood it all. And when you're interacting with ChatGPT, that's exactly what you're doing, is you're talking to somebody who knew all of everything on the internet and understood it two years ago. So some terms now that I'm going to use as we're talking about this. Uh, the first one is a neural network. So anybody who's heard anything about AI has heard about the neural net or the neural network. I've got a slide on this and a couple of slides to explain how it works. But essentially, this is how our brains work. Um, the word network literally means a work, like a work of art, that looks like a net. And so if you think about synapses and neurons, they look like nets. Um, that's how our brain works. That's how AI works. It uses these neural networks. So when you hear AI scientists talk about that, that's what those things are. What are inside of those neural nets? Well, we've got the things that are like neurons. Those are the little pieces of data. We've also got parameters. So when you hear somebody talking about an AI model and they say it has 170 million parameters or 47 squillion parameters, a parameter is the connection between neurons and that connection has weight and context. And that is how the AI decides where is it's making its way through the neural net to find your answer on the other side. Those parameters and what it knows going up to that parameter is how it decides which neuron to go to next. Um, and the next thing we're gonna talk about is sometimes when that happens, your AI hallucinates. And a hallucination in AI is when the AI just makes crap up. Um, so this is something that it didn't pull out of its corpus, that it didn't read on a blog, that it's something that it just kind of guessed. Um, and so there are a number of hilarious examples of people putting something in AI and getting something out that just doesn't make sense. So when the first time I started trying to use it to write PowerShell, it would just make commandlets up. It would say, you know, here's a command that does your thing. And I'm like, that commandlet does not exist. Um, so that's something to keep track of. Again, this is not a computer. It's not going to, you know, two plus two is not always going to be four. You might get these hallucinations. So one way you can handle hallucinations is by setting the temperature. So when you're interacting with uh, an AI, with an API or, or with prompts, you can set the temperature. The higher temperature is going to be more random, more creative. The lower temperature is going to be more concise and more real. So let's say you're using AI to write a program like we're going to do today. You're going to want that temperature to be low. But if you want the AI to do something like write a poem for you, I had it write some music for me this morning. You want that temperature high. You want it to get creative. You want it to just make crap up. Uh, so when you hear about temperatures, that's what that is. Alignment is something that's really not going to come into our discussion much today. But as you hear more about AI, you're going to absolutely hear about alignment. And that is the idea of whether AI's mission and goals that you're interacting with has the same goal as you do. So the example is like my wife and I, we communicate all the time, but sometimes we don't communicate well. I don't say the right thing. She doesn't hear the right thing. There's stuff going on and there's miscommunication. But in general, we're aligned. We're all moving in the same direction. So she never misunderstands something and then you know burns the house down or whatever because we're in alignment. Um, but that's something that we don't know about AI because we're still trying to figure that out. And the other thing is you can't really bake it in because not everybody's goals and morals and everything are the same. So if you align an AI model, what do you align it to? So when you hear people talking about AI's bad and alignment, that's what you're going to hear about. And finally, the last term is a large language model or an LLM, and that's that big neural net. That's the thing that you're going to be interacting with. Um, these, you know, GTP, GPT type uh, AIs are going to be uh, going to be full of that. Speaking of a chat GPT, what the heck is a GPT anyway? Uh, so that's one of those things that once everybody talked about it, I, you know, I had to know what it was. So the G in GPT stands for generative. And that means that this is AI that makes new things up. So if you think about AI, like the GPS in your car, that's kind of AI. It's, you know, uh, artificial intelligence figuring out the best route, but it's not creating anything. It's taking a map that it has already and roads that it has already. It's just telling you which way to go. It's not generating new things. When you work with ChatGPT, it is generating new things. You're saying, you know, write a, write a script that says, that does blah. That script didn't exist before. It's generating new things. So that's generative AI. The P stands for pre-trained, and that means that the model that you're interacting with was given instructions on how to learn before it did its machine learning. So this is, they, you know, they deal with the, the alignment issue that way sometimes, but these are this idea that it was given some, some framework on how to learn before it was given the things to learn. 
And the T uh, stands for transformer. And that was something that was a really big part of why we hear about AI at all. This was uh, developed by a Google researcher, I think in 2017. This was a new way to read data, to learn data and to output data. Again, another Silicon Re uh, Valley reference. If you watch that, there's one point where they're talking about their compression algorithm and they talk about doing the inside out compression algorithm. That's kind of what the transformer is. And this is the idea that when um, you're, you're using machine learning and training a model on some text, before the transformer would read it start to finish linearly and figure things out, the transformer says the words mean different things depending on what other words are in the sentence before and after them. And so it makes these connections between the words and it gets better context and better understanding. And it does that when it reads it and it does that when it generates new text. So that's what a transformer is. Uh, very, very cool stuff. Okay, so I promised a slide on the neural network. Um, I think we all, you know, we're all nerds here. I think our first exposure to a neural network was 30 years ago with our man Data. He was always talking about my neural network this, my neural network that. Um, and so that's what we've got. So this is how, at a very small scale, our brains work and how these large language models work. So on the left, you've got your input, you know, write me a, a script that does blah. And then the AI starts walking through these neurons and saying, I've got this piece what makes sense to happen next? And it looks at all those parameters, those weights and those uh, synapses and says, I think this is the next piece. And then it gets to the next piece and it says, okay, here's all the stuff that came before. This is probably the next piece that happens. And it makes its way through this neural network until it pops out on the other end. And that's how we get, get our output. Now, a couple of things to notice here. If you look at this neural network, at any given input, you can get to any output. So again, this is that whole, you don't want to treat it like a computer. It's not two plus two equals four. It's not deterministic. And deterministic means uh, the output can always be determined by the inputs. So two plus two is four, that's deterministic. AIs and people are probabilistic, which means as it's making its way through the neural net, this ne next jump is probably what's gonna happen next, probably the right one but not always. And so you'll notice if you're using chat GPT, anytime you type in a prompt and it gives you a response, there's a regenerate button. And basically what that's saying is, is shake everything up and run it through the neural net again and see what comes out on the other end because it's not deterministic. And so you can see how it uh, it moves around there. Um, it's, so, yeah. It's not that favorite word of mine either then. What's that? Uh, <laughs> the one that was in my brain when I started talking and now it's not. <laughs> I love oh, idempotent. <laughs> that one. <laughs> that one. Yes, it's not yes. idempotent. Idempotent. You can yeah. ask this. You can ask Chat GPT the same question twice and get two different answers. Absolutely, and and I and so that actually comes up. Um, I, I've got a million stories, but I use this stuff for all kinds of things besides coding. And one of them was last month we were back in my wife's hometown. It's a town festival. It's a small town. And we were all sitting on the deck and. One of my nephews is drinking a PBR and eating s'mores and, and somebody said something about it. And then my father-in-law is like, well, this sounds like a country song. So I whip my phone out and I'm like, chat GPT, write me a song in the style of Willie Nelson about the water carnival, include PBR and s'mores. And it wrote a country song about it. So I read it, it was great. And then I hit the regenerate button and it wrote a second song about the water carnival and PBR and s'mores because it was not deterministic. It just made it up every time. I was a big hit at that party, by the way. Only oh, that GPT shocking. would put s'mores and, and uh, PBR together, I think. <laughs> really. Yeah, so how are we going to use all of this to write better code? What are we going to talk about today? Well, now that we're all AI experts, we've got this tool here, uh, AI. How can we use it? Um, it's kind of like a genie in the bottle is the way I think about it. I really just go to AI and just ask for crazy wishes and you know, sometimes it works out. Um, but for PowerShell specifically, uh, and code in general, I, I only do PowerShell, but this is the same for Python, whatever. It's gonna make you faster. You're gonna make fewer errors. Your code is gonna end up having more functionality and it's gonna have better documentation. Um, you know, to borrow a line from, uh, from an infomercial from the 90s, eat all you want and still lose weight. That's kind of what we got going on here. Um, and while you can use it to write better code, better PowerShell and all that, you can write better anything. You can write better country songs about uh, you know, PBR and s'mores. So that's kind of gonna be our goal is to, to do that with the- with I had an interesting discussion with uh, some of the PMP guys the other day about this and Chris Kent who writes some PowerShell but also writes some JavaScript and some other stuff mentioned specifically that he found that 
the copilot and chat GPT were really, really good at writing PowerShell. So that may be partially why you're having such good experiences with it, that it tends to be really good at those things. I am, the more I use it, finding it to be absolutely terrible at writing TypeScript. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so that's interesting because I only write PowerShell, but for GitHub Copilot, which is obviously a programming specific tool, PowerShell yep. is not one of the languages that it supports natively. So right. it's like Python and C Sharp and all those fancy things. But PowerShell is like, a, well, you know, if it's if it's having a good day, it can do PowerShell. So given the exam, you know, the the luck I've got there, I can only imagine for those high level languages. Mm. Um, so again, uh, don't think about it as a computer or or software. Think about it as a form of intelligence. Uh, that's going to, it's going to give you your best, uh, best results. So then if you think about it that way, what role is this intelligence going to play with, with the specific thing you're going to do? Do you want it to create something, you know, new for you? Do you want it to help you as you're writing something on your own? Do you want to give it something you've already written and have it, you know, pick out problems or things like that? That will help as you get started to figure out how to use the tool. Now that I've been using it for a few months, I think less about that. But as you're trying to figure out how to implement AI in, that's uh, that's a good way. So um, one of the things we talked about when we were prepping for this is it's a very different mind space to be in to generate code, to think through that process and, and send it down through your fingers to the keyboard than it is to look at code somebody else has written and work through it. And depending on the type of code, depending on the mood you're in, how much coffee you've had, that switching can be tough. Um, so if you're trying to use this, keep that in mind and then, you know, segment how you're going to use it. Are you going to have it look at your code and give you examples? Are you going to have it write code and read through it yourself? That's something I like. I haven't struggled with that much, but I know Julie gets in the zone way deeper than I do. Her, her attention span is better than mine. So for her to break out of that, that's tough. Um, one of the things that I love that I use AI for all the time is to defeat the tyranny of the blank page. And this is that idea that it's just so tough to figure out how to start something. Once you get started and you've got some, some co collaboration, things like that, but just that blank page. So I will often go to chat GPT and just do that. I need this. And even if it's terrible and I don't use a bit of it, it just got those juices flowing. Um, and for uh, GitHub Copilot, that last example that, you know, uh, comment loop through. That is a great way uh, to use GitHub Copilot is to put comments in and just see how it writes the code or the comments for that mark behind you. Um, and then again, we're going to talk about a couple of tools, but just knowing which tool does the best uh, for what you're trying to do. And I'm uh, looking through in the, the, the comments quickly. So the first one is GitHub Copilot. So if you haven't noticed yet, Microsoft is naming all of their AI things something something Copilot. Uh, M365 <coughs> Copilot, Windows Copilot, whatever, GitHub Copilot. While we at Simpraxis love bagging on Microsoft for naming things poorly and they give us more than enough uh, to do that on, I really think this is a pretty good name. This is a great way to look at this as it is just that person sitting next to you looking over your shoulder and suggesting things. But again, it's the Copilot, so if it suggests something dumb, you just don't do it. It's kind of like GPS in that regard. Like I would never put a route in my GPS and just follow it if it has me drive off a cliff. I would never go to a co-pilot and say, write me some code to do this and then just check it in and walk off. Like that is just, you know. So it's kind of like the pair programming uh, trend that we saw in the late 90s, early 2000s. You've just got a couple people working on code. For GitHub Copilot, it uses the corpus that it was trained on. So again, there's these languages that it knows really well, and then some other languages that it knows less well. It uses the other open tabs that you have in that instance of VS Code, uh, and it also uses the code that you're in top to bottom. So what it doesn't isn't restricted by is if you're you know in the middle of a document um it can't you know it can read the stuff above but it also can read the stuff below so if you go back to the middle of a document and you start adding some stuff it knows the variables that are initiated later in the, the program things like that um so it's really handy for that and and really the way that i do that i'll show you in a couple of slides i just start documenting things and just see what it does um i've seen that this is both uh ten dollars a month and twenty dollars a month i wasn't sure which so i put twenty 
So this is a really quick, these asks and praxis things are not great for demos. So we didn't do any of those, but this is just to give you an idea how to start. I opened this up. You can see that arrow points down to the GitHub Copilot icon down there. When it's the little smiley face, that means it's done. When it's thinking in the background, it does this little spinning thing. So if you see it spinning, give it a give it a minute. I think um, it looks like a little chipmunk. I don't. It does. I thought I've been it trying looked like to a decide frog. or a <laughs> frog. <laughs> I, I, frog or a chipmunk? Uh, Depends yeah. on how you sort of squint at it. Yeah, yeah. A frog with braces and oh, headphones? Very straight teeth, yeah. <laughs> um, so I went in here and I had some code up in the back. I just happened to. I didn't mean to. But I just went into the, the comment and I said, connect to M365 with PNP PowerShell. And that gray text there, it just wrote the line. Hooray! So I hit tab and off we went. Um, now, had I been adding some right, uh, real code, I probably wouldn't have connected to the admin portion of that tenant, but, but that's what it gave me. So then I said, uh, get me all the lists in this site, and it came back with get PNP list. Yep, that'll do it. But as I was thinking, I'm like, I really don't need all of the lists. Uh, so then I said, show me the lists that aren't hidden or system, because I want to actually do something. So I did that, and it gave me those back, and that's the PowerShell that, that does that. Um, and then I said, okay, um, assign them all to a variable for me. And notice that it understands context. Notice that I didn't have to say, assign all of the lists that aren't system and hidden to blah, blah, blah. I said them, and it knew who them was. And so it created that, that variable. And then for the big finish, I said, if there's not a list called uh, Todd stuff, create it. So then it bundled all that up and wrote out the code. That whole exchange there took me 45 seconds, something like that. Um, so that's now again, it's like GPS. You want to check it over. It absolutely gets things wrong, makes things up, but that's how you use one of the ways that you can use this. They also have a thing called Copilot X, which is like a chat GPT window inside of here, but I just use chat GPT for it. Um, okay. So in our last couple of minutes, let's talk about chat GPT. This is really just that, that genie in a bottle. It does code, but it does everything. And so I, I generally start out when you hear people talking about a prompt in AI, the prompt is not the place that you talk. The prompt is the thing that you tell it. You're prompting the AI to the AI to work. And so I'm like, write me some PowerShell that does blah. And it and it does. That's that's just all there is to it. I find it a good compliment to GitHub Copilot. I started using it first, so I probably use it the most because I just got used to it. It's also 20 bucks a month. Get it. Uh, I Chris, use it. Krista corrected you. Krista what? corrected you in the chat. The, she did the, not. Um, she did yeah, she not. Did. Yeah, and she was I didn't right. Correct, and I didn't correct. I provided clarification. <laughs> no, 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 no. You don't. No, Krista. Let's so, let's, back, let's back up. We make I fun of the... Todd, and we tell Todd he is wrong every no. chance we get. If we can, yes. we do it. No, yes. Todd said he didn't know if it was ten or twenty. It's ten for no, individuals and both. twenty for business. I so was it's right. Both. It is ten. And I was confirming. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Krista. Don't throw me to the wolves, Julie. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, ChatGPT is 20 bucks a month, but if I'm wrong, Krista will let y'all know. So we'll, uh, <laughs> she'll do our fact checking. Um, but I use this, so I obviously use it for code, um, but I use it for everything. So like our school had a, an event at the end of the, the spring and a bunch of businesses donated stuff. I told ChatGPT to write them thank you notes and it did. So I'm like, this is the event, write a thank you note to Acme for, you know, uh, giving us some widgets. Oof, it did. And it knew when I gave it the name of the event, it knew what school it was at. It, it, it was it was amazing. So I use it for everything. I get the $20 a month out of it about seven minutes into the first day of the month. Um, that school so, event happened before September of 2021? It happened after. <laughs> but the event had happened in the past and the school existed. So, okay, so this is I would real... like that list so that I can write them all a thank you note <laughs> to let them know that Todd the, wrote them a fake thank you the, note. That I had nothing to do with it. Yeah. He was not really as thankful as he might have seemed. I'm not nearly as grateful, you yeah. know. So <laughs> this is a thing that I actually did last week. Mark and I were working on something with a, a client and we were creating uh, Windows credential store credentials for the client so the PNP could connect with it. And we did it all and it took like two minutes. I'm like, I should just write a function for this. It's something that I do every time. So this is an absolutely a real conversation I had with ChatGPT. I said, let's write a, a function called add client credential. It has four parameters, tenant name, username, password, password and test credentials. It should use the add PNP stored credential to store the credentials. And then I said, I gave it the, the ones that I wanted to save it for. Tenant.sharepoint.com, uh, tenant-admin, blah, blah, and hit enter. Okay, so 
The interesting thing here is two things to, to note from this. Number one is I didn't tell it what those parameters were supposed to do. I just said what the parameters were and it understood. The first thing that it did was, uh, you know, tell me what those were going to do. And that's the second thing to know. Notice that it doesn't just give me results back from something somebody else did. It understands what I wanted and it understands what it's doing because it explains it to me and then gives me the code. So tenant name is the name of the tenant, like Contoso. Um, and I didn't use Contoso in there. Like it, it, it figured that out on its own. So then uh, that right picture there is the beginning of, of that script. So I said, okay, uh, that's great and all. But um, when, oh, I screwed up my uh, my my uh, screenshot here. So then I said, okay, um, when when you when you're gonna add this credential, look and see if a credential is already there. I don't want to overwrite anything. And so it's like certainly. And now I just added the thing. So it starts with the code, and you can see in the right hand thing. It now before it uh, saves the credentials, it tries to get the credentials. And if it's not null, it says, hey, do you want to overwrite these credentials? Awesome, good work, I appreciate that. So then I say, okay, that looks good. Uh, now I wanna be very understanding for the user that runs it. If they don't enter a, a tenant name and all that kind of stuff, prompt them for it. And it says, no problem, and it does that. But the other thing that's interesting was in the previous screenshots, the tenant name and username and all that, those parameters were mandatory. So mandatory equals true. But now that it knows that it's gonna handle that later, it switched those to false so that it could run its code, did that all on its own. Um, okay, so then I had to add a thing to see if the PNP PowerShell was installed, tell them to install it if it wasn't there, so they do that. Um, and then I said, as I was looking at it, and I'm testing this all the while, so it spits the code out, I run it, I, and it gives me more ideas. So now I'm running this, and I'm noticing that it tells me it's going to overwrite a credential, but it doesn't say for who. So I say, okay, uh, you did that thing with the credentials. Now show me the name of the person whose credential it's overwriting. It's like, no problem. So now it went in and changed its code, and it knew that when it did the whole get stored uh, credential that there was a username property. So now it shows us that. Do you want to overwrite the credential for blah? Awesome, thanks uh, ChatGPT for that. Um, and then I'm, I think I'm done, I'm like, well, this looks great. Write all my documentation for me and give me some examples. And it did, so you can see there, it wrote the function, the synopsis, the description, all of that. Um, and then as I was looking at it, I was really getting greedy at this point. I'm like, so this is great, but but users can be dumb. So they might type their tenant name in as, as Contoso, or they might type it as contoso.sharepoint.com or Contoso, whatever figure all that out and just do it right. And it's like, no problem. And this was fun because not only did it do the thing that I wanted, but I've done this before, which is why I thought about it. And it was like 10 lines of code as I trapped for everything. It did it in one line of regex, which I would have never in a thousand years with a thousand monkeys and a thousand typewriters been able to come up with the regex that did that. And it just did it um, in one line. Um, and so finally, then at the end, I'm like, all right, we're all good. What did I miss? Tell me some of the things I should check for. And so it gave me this list of seven things, and I've got five of them there. Uh, and then, uh, oh, the, uh, go back. And then it just shows them. Slide there. What happened? Um, so, and then it shows me the one. I'm like, well, you know, I like those ideas, but I really only want to do a couple of them. So add those. And it's like, no problem. And uh, and it did it all. You say you keep saying it says no problem, but it says certainly. Certainly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, very true. You get to know your chat GPT, dude. Yeah, so all of this conversation from start to finish, it cranked out about 107 lines of code, something like that. This was about 10 minutes. This took me about 10. Now, I could have done all of this on my own. Would have probably taken 30 minutes, maybe. I don't know. This was 10 minutes. I said earlier that the reason I used this was because it made me write code faster. So I think that was probably true. Fewer errors, which I think was probably true. More functionality, because as I was getting through, I was thinking of more things, and there was no barrier to, to trying it. Like, I just had to think of it, and then the code was just magically there. Uh, and better documentation. So when I got all done, I'm like, document this for me. So I, I, I think it delivered. And I can uh, confirm that that's how long it took him because I asked him <laughs> about this and then he came back in about 10 minutes and said, look at this. And I yes. said, what's that? <laughs> yeah, because I just sent him like a screenshot and it was all blurry. He couldn't see. I was just damned excited. I couldn't. Uh... Um, so here's some resources. Sean Wang um, is, is on a, the, that podcast that Julie <laughs> linked earlier. Uh, links to ChatGPT and Copilot. I did this with demos for the the our platform Microsoft call here a couple of months ago. So you can see this with demos. 
Mark Andreessen, y'all might remember him. Uh, what did he do? Oh, Netscape and Mosaic. Uh, so he's part of the Andreessen Horowitz uh, venture capital. They are all in on AI. So he wrote this really great blog post on how AI will save the world. And I agree with him. Cool. And I can't believe, so every time I practiced that, I was like 32, 33 minutes. And I can't believe I got it all in. Wow, look at you, one minute under. And so we are at the final slide. Uh, our next episode of Aston Praxis is on September 6th. We're gonna talk managing permissions in modern SharePoint. And that landscape has changed uh, pretty significantly. So um, we probably will have <laughs> yes. a lot of interesting things to talk about. Uh, see us live. So Todd and Mark are going to Seth and that's in Stockholm, Sweden. September 11th and 12th. I think, Todd, you're going to be doing this, a full session on this there. Yeah, so I'll be doing an hour-long version of it there. Everyone should get their airplane tickets. Yeah, if you right want to see now. beautiful Stockholm, which is pretty much my favorite place to visit, I think, uh, you should definitely go check that out. Collab Days New England, uh, which um, the Wholesome Praxis team helps uh, coordinate. Uh, that's happening October 21st, and registration is now open. The agenda's up. All of that good stuff. Uh, if you know any organizations that would like to sponsor us, please have them reach out to us. Uh, but that is happening. So definitely consider for our local people registering and joining us live. Uh, and also 365 Educon in Chicago is October 30th through number November 3rd, and you can register for that. Derek and I will be there uh, sharing our coding goodness. So that is all we have for today. There's some links in the chat. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time on Aspen Practice. Thank you, have a great day. Bye everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this week on Aspen Praxis. We love getting your questions or session ideas. You can submit by using the link in about. If you find this helpful, hit that like or subscribe button and share this content with your colleagues.